really light-hearted things. You're just such a flowers and perfume oh, kind. Oh God! Now the political poems. Okay, enough <laughs> jokes. Joke time's over. Thank you. Here. Hi everyone. This one is called The Hunting House. I think after my poems, I'll do a little short explanation about it, because I, you know, it's fun. My demons come out to play. No reservations. We're all stocked up, no room. The list is full. You look like you've traveled a long way. Come inside. Check out what you might get next time. Life is nothing if we don't take even the smallest risks. You are more than welcome to enter. Take off your boots, make yourself comfortable. We haven't taken the plastic off the couches yet. Brand new carpet too. Thus more plastic, you understand. Don't be shy, take a look around. It's nice in here, the fridge is pristine. Fresh from Japan, it has a touch screen. Try it out, go ahead. Order a pizza, pepperoni, it's on me. Just tap on the freezer door, it's like a smartphone, you can do it. Don't take too long. I need to go to the restroom, I'll be right back. Behind the toilet there is an aged wooden door, don't worry, no secrets here, just a nice house. I know, earlier I said no reservations. Truth is, I've been waiting for the right walk-in. And you, sir, are that walk-in. Plenty of other folks have come before you. None of them have what you have. A gentle silence. You follow instructions. And I doubt you're going to tell anyone about this. It's a secret. Trust me. The police know this place well. I've had incidents in the past. It's all good, though. Nice neighborhood. With the equipment here. Ah. Uh, you want to make sure to lock the windows and doors. Speaking of locks, I want to keep that front door locked and shut. People seem to think I'm having a party, and they all want to crash it. Thank you so much for understanding. By the way, I'm going to take off my socks. Do you mind doing the same? I'm super OCD. Not literally, just do as I do, but not exactly. I have a hot tub in the backyard. Also a pool. We have an extra pair of swim trunks. I'm going to take a shower. I don't want any excess germs in the tub, know what I mean? It's a walk-in shower, too, by the way. Super fancy. How do you like this place so far? It's really nice, right? If I sell this, no, give you this house, will you show it the same respect you showed me? Or are you going to break my heart? and choose not to stay here. I won't be here, but you can call me. Well, first that shower, come on, don't be shy. We're just a couple of dudes. No pressure, not really, just, you know, I'm getting you a pizza, and you have been so kind. I want you to experience the best of this place. That's way, when you go to what used to be your home, you can fantasize about the next part of your life. Please don't disappoint me. Please don't look this gift horse in the mouth. It hurts to get bit by a horse. All right, go ahead of me. Don't look at my dingly bits. I trust you won't try anything. Well, I have had some incidents. Say, did you ever play baseball? I love that game. Nothing weird about it. It's really steamy. I'm starting to doubt that's really you. Um, this is going to sound weird, but... Can I touch your shoulder? No? I understand. Just wanted to make sure you were real. Never mind. Let's get into that hot tub. The upstairs are off limits. Been debugging that part of the house. Sorry, it's awkward, but I guarantee bugs will not be a problem for you. Come to think of it, nothing will. I've already seen it. Seen to it. So. That's actually a poem about boundaries. Now, you wouldn't think, oh, that's, that's horror. That's kind of funny. But no, it's about boundaries. Because when it comes to boundaries, the scariest people are the ones who violate them subtly. They push you in little ways. And I've been in some situations very similar to this and gotten out. <sighs> How are y'all doing? Look at this crowd. 
This is amazing. All right. So this next, these next two poems are all about high school. This one's about theater, a theater club. Drinking apple cider, the kind for adults, playing lonely games of pool, pocket thoughts, past events, poem, start. High school theater club, backstage, a full mirror, taller than all but one. One who always has to crane their neck to see themselves. The one person who sticks out better than the rest. More dedicated, always on time, always a tree in all the plays, never getting to reach their potential. It's a crime against the rest. My reflection doesn't match my feelings. I'm always smiling, but I'm dead-eyed. Fit in the costume, well-modeled, nothing is new, it's a Midsummer Night's Dream, a classic. Every year we do this one, and every year I always play Oberon. It's an easy role. The tall man, he wanted to play Puck. He had the attitude to be bottom, still silly, clumsy, all over, personality doesn't match, silent, reserved, hidden away in the background, watching with resentment. My reflection looks a little odd today. Blood spots under my chin. Eyes are small. Nose is huge. Too sleepy to think more. It's just blurry vision. The tall man seems a little different. He moves bombastically, and he doesn't he seem as tall, his reflection. No neck craning. He can see himself. No folding or gut sucking. He smiles. His eyes are close together in his nose. It's more centered, less hooked. His jaw's perfect. The next day, my face starts bleeding. In the middle of blocking, my skin itches. I start carrying Benadryl around. Two weeks later, my allergies are worse than ever. Bones hurt. I've been growing. The tall man, he's changed again. He looks good. He seems shorter than last time. His attitude is fresh, charismatic, slang for miles. Suddenly people start avoiding me. I swear folks are whispering about me. It's in my head. The next morning, I'm coughing hard all day. It's the night of the show and I'm too sick to be there. I quit theater. Something in me tells me to. It says, they don't want me. They don't need me. The tall man makes front cover of the school paper. He looks different. He doesn't look tall at all. He looks a lot like me, in fact. I gave this guy crap for years. Not in a serious way. Now it's coming back to me, and I'm not entirely sure if there is an explanation beyond karma or some kind of stage curse. After all of this, the other kids started bullying me, calling me the Jolly Green Giant. I did one last play. In it, I was a tree. I stared into my mirror, looking deep into myself. Every day I was getting taller. The hair on my arms stood up. In the mirror, standing behind me, was a perfect caricature of myself when I was even younger. Now I don't look at mirrors. I avoid windows. Since those days, I never moved out of my parents' house. It's better this way, I guess. Don't judge people on how they look. Hateful thoughts can grow and mutate. They can alter your body. They can warp reality. Justice is always present. Watching from the other side of the mirror. It's always there, just outside the corner of our eye. Mm. Woo! <laughs> so, my back kind of hurts for some reason. Would it be all right if I sat down? And maybe, perhaps I should read something from this lovely book. Because these poems are a little shorter. <coughs> Get it? Because of the tall man? <laughs> but this is a 12 of 93. My wonderful partner over there in the suit did all the illustrations. So today's the fifth. All right, so let's see. May 5th, June 6th, 
July 5th, Aaron. July 5th, 1993, Aaron. Aaron didn't want to grow old. Peter Pan was this kid's role model. All the boy wanted was to stay up all night. Aaron sat at his bed praying to the spirits of his parents' house. One day, a shadow would detach. He would fly in through a crack in the window, dancing around the room. A boy in green tights would sneak inside. Aaron had a special place where he could play make-believe all day long. Aaron always wanted to meet a fairy. In the morning dew, by the wild raspberry bushes, July was not a nice month to be a fairy. It was loud and hot, barely a thing to drink, hardly a drop of early morning mountain sparkle. Aaron was concerned that day. His parents would force him to stop playing make-believe. Water was scarce in Rogue's Peak that summer. It was early in the morning when Aaron snuck a bowl of plain tap water to his favorite raspberry bush, a final good deed. Aaron was surrounded by fairies, orange, yellow, and blue bouncing fairies, dancing in circles around the happy boy. That must have been what he saw. The town saw something different. He saw another child go missing, a forest fire, and of course, crying parents. The night before, Heron had been talking to someone, someone invisible, who sounded desperate. One of the lost boys had gone missing, an open invitation in a way. Most of the surrounding houses within a 12 block radius had been left in ruin. The raspberry bushes where Aaron used to play are greener and more full of life than they should be. Aaron's sacrifice had one good effect. It may well have saved one small patch of berries. That theory can't be tested or proven. One can dream, though. Rest in peace, Aaron Arthur Pierce. June 6th, 1980 through July 5th, 1993. A panpipe is waiting in Fiddler's Green. And... That's from 12 of 93. Let's see. How am I doing on time? It looks like I'm like halfway through. Yeah. Halfway. Oh, boy. So I guess I'll tell you a little <laughs> bit about this book because it's kind of funny. So the cover, actually, I took this picture the day I got the inspiration to write this book. I had terrible writer's block. And when I get writer's block, I sometimes go to extreme lengths to get rid of it. And in this case, I went to this, these woods that were kind of creepy. I found like a fort out there. I got a Foster's beer, a little bit of pot, and I went there right as the sun was setting. And I was pacing around in the woods trying to come up with something. And I realized these woods were an abandoned mountain biking trail. And I was thinking, well, something bad must have happened to make this abandoned. Boom, 1293, blossomed. Wrote it in a week. And I still love this area, because it's not like a normal part of Eugene, in my opinion. It looks like another state. And it's just off, the, off of Hawkins. Oh boy, this is fun. I love it. <laughs> and I don't know, there's something about it. You know, I, I got lost in the woods a few times when I was a kid too, and I think it just been kind of brewing inside me to get that out. <sighs> Audience, you are very quiet. <laughs> good listeners. This is not good. I know. <laughs> you might know that, yes. Oh, obviously. How many of you have been to Kush? Ah. Yeah. Very good. So, let's see. I think I'm going to read one about a trickster. This one's kind of sad. It's not really like my other stuff I've read tonight. A lone passenger pigeon, en route via the Great Plains over the Rocky Mountains, 
The next mockingbird imitates a machine that buzzes and beeps, an iron lung dumped in a cave. The greatest dangers are yet to arrive, peaceful, isolated farming communities, stuck in the innocent days before universal trade, back when every product was a gift freely shared amongst neighbors and family members. Questioning the gods was a requirement, worshiping the sacred tricksters, sending out riddles and tongue twisters, passenger pigeons sleeping in for a few more days, 10,000 leagues into the sky toward upper hell and into space. Underneath the innocent valley, a massive root cellar filled with carrots and potatoes, radishes and parsnips, root vegetables and mushrooms. Love wasn't a word, as much as an element back then. It was the wind and the rain tricking people into feeling so very sad while it tended to the many acres. Hatred was not yet an element. It was only fate that struck the young down. It wasn't anything evil that made folks die young. Curiosity was nature. It was the wild trying to progress, to see more. God was always around, playing practical jokes on bored children. Some days it rained poultry, the sky above stuffed with all the birds that were yet known. God introduced new things when people grew restless. This God was beyond people. It was a tender asking nothing of his little world. This God wasn't a God at all, in fact. He was something else, something beyond closed eyes. Locked up nice and tight, wheezing and coughing, sending a mental SOS out into the world. Fed through a tube in its lower abdomen. Infer infernal things happened in the village. The sun would forget to set. Night would arrive without any stars. The trees would suddenly crash to the ground. The arbors that bear 16 different fruits, ranging from plums to peaches to cherries to pears, apples and oranges, apricots and avocados, would bear rotten fruit, unedible. Famine arrived. So too did the janitorial locust. The machine didn't shut down. It kept it kept pumping away, this iron lung, built to keep the child alive, had failed its mission as the mi mind shuts down. A passenger pigeon with a scrap of paper wrapped around its thin leg lands eloquently on the pillow next to the child's face. It weeps little bird tears. And the message was from a little girl living under a thatched roof on the strap, it says, we thank you for every gift. You have been kind to our world. I know what's happened to you. As long as we survive, you will always be with us, our kind trickster. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, Oh, the tricksters of the world, where would we be without them? Mmm, it's time for one last little thingy. This has been a real privilege, I gotta say. You know, it's nice getting to do this. And so, I will end my set with the most bitter holiday poem ever that I wrote yesterday. <laughs> because... Well, I'm pretty bitter about the holidays. <laughs> you know, that it's only appropriate. It is December. Mm -hmm. As any for many, as any for many. Parking lots disguised as forests. The state tree is the Douglas fir. In search of that perfect cozy day, dust swept outside. A line of salt between the past and the present. Sealing the future in a magic circle. They had just got married. They weren't from around here. They fell in the river. They were, they were, they were. They are, they are, they are. They could have been everything. 
The forest isn't pretending to be some to be anybody's fetish. Christmas kills another logger. Silver and gold, silver and gold, working on the holidays. Time is as real as we make it. All across the country the crowds gather. One year later, watching for the ball, it drops and drops deciding it's a new year. After the celebration is over, the day after New Year's, stumbling drunk. All the needy children crawl back into their holes. The soup kitchens close. Everything returns to the usual dirty meals. It's always a publicity stunt when the famous help in the kitchen. It's always a stunt when the rich leave with the same amount of hubris in their pocket. Christmas is the invader's holiday, silencing the other cultures, forcing the other holidays to sit in the attic, occasionally inviting them down so long as it is agreed everyone says grace. Everything is store-bought. If the season is true, children open store-bought presents, wrapped in store-bought paper, under a store-bought tree. All the ornaments, even the ones from the 1950s, were bought in a store. The materials were store-bought, too. Families traveling to town, living in the tree lots for a month. The annual income. A big tree costs too much. A little tree is for shame. It's never big enough. Pressure in the wallet. Pressure in the head. Illness all around. Vaccinations are sin. If God intended us to live beyond childhood, we wouldn't have disease. Do not take his blessings for granted. And that's spite. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for having me. Thanks, Thanks Jane. Thank, thank you. you. And remember, only you can prevent four.